All right, so we are going to start by looking at this poem, which is in, was it chapter, yeah, chapter 18, is that right? Chapter 18 is what we just did? We, we just did 17. 17, sorry. For some reason, my book's in 19. I didn't but, check any of my um, work. I got that late. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, I got it out late. Oh, no, that's, I mean, um, that's okay. But, um, so this is what's called an, Eleg I think it's called an elegaic couplet. I think that's how I've heard it pronounced. I could be wrong, but, um, anyway, it's a couplet. I've put the meter here. It's made up of um, two lines, couplet, of one, two, three, four, five, six feet on the first one. So that's called hexameter, hex, um, six measurements, and we call each little break a foot. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Hexameter, hexameter, and then the second line is made up of one, two, three, I'll talk about that in a second, for five feet. So it's hexameter and pentameter. And um, this meter goes way back to the ancient Greeks. The Romans, of course, pick it up from the Greeks and start writing their own um, couplets on this uh, form. And uh, even certain English poets, I think Coleridge was known for writing in the, the elegate couplet, and back all the way from the Greeks, they thought that in the six and five, they saw a simple rising and falling action, a rising and falling action. So the first six kind of build up, and then generally speaking, the last five bring you back down. However, what's interesting or what's fun is Marshall's a humorist. That's how he made his money. I mean, literally how he made his money. But um, so with Marshall's couplets, what you'll see is he, he sets you up for the joke after this double line, which is called the principal pause. Uh, so we could really think of it as, you know, the punchline of his joke, so to speak. And, and that's very common for humorists when they can to use the main, um, in certain meters it's called a kaisera, um, but anyway, the main pause, so the principal pause, to set up the baradach of, of the joke. So um, let's look at scanning and let's look at how this is set up um, to work as far as the meter goes. So for both lines we have um, 11 feet total, and uh, for Greeks and Romans there uh, are a couple different options. This, this particular meter only has two options per foot. Uh, the first option could be what's called a dactyl, which a dactyl, if you know your dinosaurs, uh, is your finger, a pterodactyl. Um, so the dactyl is mimicking the, the bones of your finger. So hold on, I'll get it this way. So in your bones in your finger, you have a long bone and a short bone and a short bone. So that's a dactyl. And uh, that'll be there for a couple days now. But anyway, so there's your dactyl, long, short, short. Um, the other, and, and actually the Romans, if you read Homer, if you read uh, Virgil, their entire Iliad, Odyssey, and Aeneid are all written with every foot being either a dactyl or a spondy. So a dactyl would be basically a half note, quarter, quarter, half, quarter, quarter, um, and a spondy would go half, half. So two, one, one, two, two. So. What about uh, the the good old, so I'll talk about that in a second. So the British, the classic British is uh, a shave and a hair cut. And then you'd have the dump, dump, another spawning, two pence. So anyway. All right, so with the elegant couplet, this does not look like a, a dactyl or a spawning. And what we learn is how to read the meter is these large capital U's signify the, the, a flexible option. So the capital U could either be a short, short, or a long. So it could be a short, short, or a long, a short, short, or a long. Because if you think about it musically, as a meter, um, as a meter, they're interchangeable, right? A quarter note and a quarter note, a half note. Mm -hmm. Okay, so musically, which by the way, when the Romans um, and the Greeks talk about music instruction, this is a huge part of what they mean, is poetic instruction. Um, you want to be able to hear the beats. So anyway, so we've got um, the first four feet are either spondies or dactyls. So it could go long, long, or it could go long, short, short. Same thing, long, long, or long, short, short. Long, long, okay. Then the fifth foot, notice we only have one option. The fifth foot must be a dactyl, long, short, short. And then the sixth foot must be a spondy, long, long. 
The second line, the pentameter line, again, same thing. We've got options up front, either long, short, short, spon uh, dactyl, or long, long, uh, spondy, same thing. Then we have one long into the principal pause, then a dactyl, dactyl, and then a long. So this is kind of a cut short spondy, you can think of it as. And that's very common for the last, um, the last foot in the meter. Um, it even happens when you have running poetry. It's often, you'll often see the last foot get broken short. Um, or only have like half of a short or something like that. So anyway, you have some flexibility, um, but of course there's a lot of inflexibility. So we are going to try to now scan this line. This is fun. Everybody have fun. Here we go. Here are the rules for scanning to remember. Every syllable is either long or short. Either long or short. It is long if one of two conditions is met. One is it's long, we call by nature. By nature. If we have a macron vowel or if we have a diphthong. That's called long by nature. Or it can be long by position. Does anybody remember what long by position means? I think we talked about this. It's been easy four months since we looked at a poem. Do you remember position? Position means it's followed by two consonants. Two consonants. So let's just pause there for a second, and we'll kind of walk through some of these examples. And then, of course, if it's not long, then it's short. <laughs> so really, the, the real work is figuring out if it's long. So let's look at the poem. Quem recitas meus est o fidentina libellus, sed mole cum recitas incipit est us. Let's find some long by nature's because of macrons. Where are some long by nature macrons? Good, we've got that long A. O. O, yeah. There's a long one. B and then T. Any other longs? By, uh, sorry, by Macron? Yeah, there it is again in the recitas. Nice little poetic device. We have a nice repetition here. We don't really have, um, we don't have any proper diphthongs here. Not like maze, it, this could be. It, it, we'll, we'll kind of see that in just a second, what's going on there. Um, otherwise, we don't really have diphthongs here. So let's look at long by position. Again, position means it's followed by two consonants, but that could be across two words. So for example, our first word, quem, is long by position, because we've got an M and an R. So going into the next word, we can see that's long. So let's um, actually now start to bring some shape to the meter. So quem, and now we have the question, do I have a long, short, short, or a long, long? Reque. Long, short. Those are short. Those are too short, yeah. So we don't have a macron, we don't have a diphthong, and they're not followed by two vowels. So there's our first foot. Quem reque. Uh, Meus est. Short, short. Okay, so let's look at this, because I can tell you with est, is est going to be long or short? It feels long. It is long, don't, but why is it long? Est, est, est. How about by position? Is that E followed by two consonants? Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. Look at that. <laughs> so now we've got kind of two options, and, and EU is going to give us both options. Remember, EU is kind of that pseudo diphthong where you have an eto, right? It's not one sound, like, say, in, in English, U, EU would come together to make the sound U. In Latin, it's actually eg. So we can scan it as the long diphthong, but we're still going to almost treat it as that. So, tas meus. Tas meus. So, again, it almost sounds like a dactyl. We can scan it either way, but because this is a, a, a proper diphthong, we'll scan it long. Okay? Est o. Do we have a foot? Yeah. Long, long. Yep. Here we go. So, by the way, we've now seen dactyl, long, short, short. Spondy, long, long. Spondy, long, long. Now we're at our fourth foot. One, two, three, four. So we still have options. So fee, den. What is this? Is this long or short? Den. Long. Why? Because of the N and the T? The N and the T is correct. So here we go. We split it. 
phi den t. Now though, notice we're now in our fifth foot. Our fifth foot demands a dactyl. So sure enough, does, does it have a dactyl? Yep. Teen ne oh. le. See it? Yep. Ne. So teen le. Teen le. And then here we go. Look, no. it demands a spondy. Bell. Uh -huh. Us. So there is our hexameter line. Dactyl, spondy, 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 dactyl, spondy. So it's going to go like this. Long, short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, long. Quem recitas me sesto feed and teen elements. I'm probably overemphasizing it, but anyway. All right. So here we go. Next line. We've got said. By the way, it's my first syllable. I know it has to be long. So let me ask, why is it long? My meter tells me it must be long. the D and the M. Go to the D and the M. Long by position. So there's one. Now we have long. mullet. Mullet. Yeah, that's short, short. That's short. So we have a dactyl. So long, short, short. Come with recitas. What's going to come here? Long. And again, we kind of know that has to be long. Again, it's long by position, MR. So here's reke. Short, short. Short, short again. So dactyl, dactyl. Toss. Here we go. Notice, by the way, we just came to our principal pause. Notice how it's reflected in the punctuation. And we'll actually see it's at also uh, represented in the translation. So there's our principal pause. And overwhelmingly, in English, we'll see commas come in where those principal pauses are. Okay? So, in kippet. And by the way, actually, if I look at my meter, I know it has to be a dactyl. So, sure enough, in, there's a double consonant, kippet. There's a dactyl. Essa. Again, I could cheat and look kind of at my, my elegant couple that tells me I need this. But why is this E long again? Two S's. Two S's, long by position. Se, short, T, short, and long. Huh. There it is. Um, I can't, it's called the ictus. Ictus, the accent, um, would fall, by the way, on the first, uh, the pull-up step of every meter. So anyway, that's the, the, the rhythmical. But they would the do that in Latin thing. as easily as we would do... Some we would do limerick or something. Yeah, yeah, a bit of poetry that we might recite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have wished a bird would fly away and not sing by my house all day. I have clapped my hands at him from the door when it seemed as if I could bear no more. Yeah, so you kind of hear the flow to it. Hear it yeah. Same thing. Okay, so let's look at the translation then, and, and in particular, it's kind of interesting how the principal pause plays out. So. We see, let's look through for our verbs. Um, by the way, when you scan it all up, you can see how it makes kind of a mess, <laughs> a little bit of it. You, gotta, you almost want to translate it and then scan it because, yeah, there's a lot of extras up on the board right now. But um, we can see on our first line, we end with a semicolon, which of course means we have a complete thought. So really, we can ignore the second line for the translation's sake. Keep it simple, students. So we've got <laughs> rekatas as our only verb. So what does rekatas mean? Recite. Yeah, and so who is reciting? You. You are. Good. So this says you recite. So um, we don't have a subject, right? Because it's I don't see a two and it's hidden in the verb, so I'm not going to look for a subject. So of course the question is, what do you recite? The book. I. You don't recite the book. The book is in the nominative. You can't recite the book. The book. We also have this verb, est, right here, right? How about this? Meus est libellus. Mine is the book, or the book is mine, quem recitas. That you recite. Which you recite. Good, so we might say this way. The book which you recite is mine. And then this is his friend. This is very common in poetry to call out your friend. 
By the way, it's also very common for your friend to have a name that works perfectly in the meter. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm the, I always wonder how, how many of these guys <laughs> are really talking to a friend, or are they talking to a friend whose name scans perfectly? So anyway, sometimes it's more convenient than others. Anyway, so his name's Fidentinus. So, oh, Fidentinus, the book which you are reciting is mine. So let's ignore after the principal pause, because that's kind of the punchline. So here we go. Said male cum recitas, and here cum is not prepositional cum; it's adverbial cum, meaning when. So said male. So when, but when you recite badly, badly, poorly, when you recite poorly, we're build up for incipit esse to us. Here we have a complementary infinitive esse. So incipit. It's all you. That's exactly, well, it's kind of, it begins, as said to us, it begins yours. to be yours, yeah. So, you know, kind of a, I'll claim it when it's nice, I'll claim it when it sounds good, uh, but you do such a poor job with my lines, you can have them. <laughs> so there you can kind of see how the principal pause plays into his, his favor, which is, works a little differently than... Um, kind of your normal elegaic couplet, which has a, a rising action and then brings you back down to earth, so to speak. And just kind of a... And this, as a joke, it, you use the principal pause for a different reason, namely to get your laugh. So, so there you go. That's a little bit of extra fun in scansion. I thought I brought my markers. I didn't. Therefore, I have to use this eraser also. All right. Chapter 18. Now, this chapter is going to give us a great opportunity to a lot of review in, um, because what we're going to find is, as we shore up and remind ourselves of our foundation, it is going to make this chapter extremely easy with only really one grammatical adaptation. And I don't say easy because it doesn't involve work. I say easy because, well, we'll see. So we're going to talk about how to make, uh, how to create all of our present system verbs. So let's talk about what that means that it's a present system and then how to make them. So I'm going to take a good old verb, um, because this is Latin, we're going to grab amo, amare, amali, amatum. And when we look up a verb in the dictionary, right, these are the four principal parts that they give us. And when you hear principal part, I want you to think um, building blocks, right? They're, they're the, the print caps, the foundation stones, really is, is a good way to think of that word. The principal, right? That's, isn't that the, the financial company, right? That's what that is, the foundation stone of the principal. So when we say principal parts, we're talking about... If you need to build something, you are going to, it's going to come off of these principles, period. Um, so we divide these kind of principles into really two groups. The first group is called the present system because it builds off of the present principal parts. The other group, um, I'm going to kind of ignore the fourth principal part here, but it, it, it applies also, perfect. is called the perfect system. Good. The perfect system. So this week, we're really not going to talk at all about the perfect system beyond just a little refresher, just to kind of bring it through our mind one more time. The tenses that belong in the perfect system are, so the specific tenses are the perfect tense, the pluperfect tense, and the future perfect tense. I don't really want to spend a ton of time with these this week because I want to make sure we get through the present system. But I just want to remind us, because it's going to apply in a second to the present. When we're talking about verbs and we see in our names perfect or pluperfect or future perfect, or actually what we're going to see over here, right, is imperfect along with the present and future. When we talk about perfect or perfected verbs... Do you remember, pardon me, what word we can kind of substitute out or what, when we're talking about verbs, what perfect means? 
completed. Completed, right. So in a nutshell, what we're talking about when we look at the perfect system are verbs that when we use them are talking about a completed action. For example, I went to the store. Or a pluperfect way back in the past, I had gone to the store. Or this is probably the weirdest to us as English speakers. The future perfect, something that will have been done in the future relative to another verb. So for example, when we get to Rome in a week, so it's a future, when we get to Rome, we will have packed our bags, or we will have gotten on the plane, or whatever it is. So it's a future view, but it's something that's done before that future. So all of the perfect system is talking about verbs that, or actions that have been completed uh, relative to something else. Okay? So when we see the imperfect, what we're talking about is a not completed action. So, for example, I ran to get breakfast versus I was running to get breakfast. When, and you can kind of hear it, like, when what happened? An imperfect almost always sets you up for interruption. I was running when I was hit by the car. Um, I was walking down the street when I heard the birds or something like this. So, almost always the imperfects are going to set you up for some kind of interruption. Same thing in English, too. Right, you would never you would want your students to be writing things that were like, and we were walking, and we were talking, and we were singing, and we were you like, so what? And then what? Yeah, like, so so the imperfect kind of, and then what happened? So um, all I have to say is the perfect reminds us that it's a completed action, but we're not going to talk about that. So I'm going to erase the principal parts, and I'm going to erase the perfect system, because tonight all we're going to talk about is the present system. And again, by system, we mean you need to know the first two principal parts to be able to build these verbs. You need to know these two principal parts, the first two, to build the verbs. Okay? So let's talk about, we're going to walk through each of these three tenses, how to build it, and then you'll see just one little change is going to make all the difference in the world. So we're going to go through our steps of how to build the present how to build the imperfect, and how to build the future for first and second conjugation verbs. So actually, let me write that real big, woo, for first and second conjugation verbs. Because I want to respect what Professor Wheelock did, um, and he broke up here first and second conjugation verbs. And so if he does it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to submit to him. All right. So to take a verb and to conjugate it in the present active indicative, or what we're going to see tonight, in the present indicative at all, there are five steps that we're going to follow. Five steps which are going to guarantee us happiness. And I'm going to use the verb amo amare. Okay. The first thing that is really helpful for us as students, so I'm going to list the steps and I'm going to actually conjugate it you know, actively. No pun intended, sorry. Um, is number one, I want the students to always copy the first principal part. Copy the first principal part. So if we're looking at the verb amo amara, of course the first principal part is amo. And I like to teach the students to do that just because it gets you started. <laughs> and if we try to go to a stem, we'll make a mess of things, I guarantee it. The second thing, and the third thing that I teach the students to do, kind of go together. The second is to go to the infinitive. Think of Buzz Lightyear. Go to the infinitive. Which is the second principal part. Go to the infinitive and chop off the R-E. Okay. And that gives us what we call the stem. The stem. And again, this stem is the thing that we're going to build everything off of. It's like a plant. Everything comes off of the stem. It comes out of the stem. Um, the flowers and the leaves and everything is going to come off of the stem. I guess heads and the flowers come out of the, the head? What's that called? Anyway, all right. So it gives us the stem. So I go to the second principal part. I chop off the area that gives me amma. So I teach the students to always copy amma. Actually, it was funny. The... Um, I think it was actually your son 
who asked, um, I noticed some of the students were not doing this. And I said to them, trust me. Trust me, I give you these steps for a specific reason. Um, and, and now it's going to actually become clear. And I showed them on Thursday this little bit here that you're about to do. <coughs> so I've copied down my code. <coughs> exactly. I've followed my steps. Now to this point, so far in Latin, the fourth step has been add your endings. Add your endings. But I want to show you the new trick. Here it is. This fourth step is add your endings. But the question is, do we want to add our active endings or our passive endings? Because so far in Latin, when we've chanted our endings, let me throw them up here. When we chant our endings, we've only been using, as is appropriate, we've only been using active endings. So we've seen M or O S T M U S T S M N T. And if you if you think about it, it actually hasn't mattered which of these tenses it was. So, for example, in the imperfect, we saw that was bum bas but bum was bat is bunt. Or in the future, bo bis bit bim bis bit is bunt. Right? Present. Amo amas amat amamus amatus amat. It hasn't mattered because we've only been playing with now what you're going to realize are the active endings. So step four is going to be the same, but now we're going to have the extra question of, do I need this verb to be active or do I need this verb to be passive? So here we go. This is the new list of endings. The passive endings. It's fitting that hockey season just started because these always make me think of hockey. The Rister, I grew up in Dallas, and there was a guy named Mike Madonna who just had the greatest wrist shot, um, just famous, he'll go in the Hall of Fame soon, I think, um, for his Rister. So these are the passive endings, and they are Rister, Mermini, Inter. Rister, Mermini, Inter. Rister, Mermini, Inter. I don't know why I find that so funny. <laughs> If you want, I bring in a hockey stick also. But So we are going to do the same exact steps, but instead of now going amo, amas, amat, amamos, amatis, amant, now we're going to do it with passive endings. So instead of saying, I love, you love, he loves, we love, y'all love, they love, here we go. We're going to receive the love. I am loved. You are loved. He, she, or it is loved. We are loved. Y'all are loved. Y'all are loved. They are loved. So the whole point of you don't kill the backgrounds on those. That's, That's the, the payoff. payoff. Here we go. So then the fifth step, which again the students have been trained in for years by this point, is now we kill our macrons. Because that was what the fifth graders were at, or fourth graders were asking was, I just, I know I'm going to kill it. Don't do it yet. Just start to train yourself to understand the fifth step and the final step, which is kill your macrons. And we kill our macrons for two reasons. Um, if there's two macrons in a row, okay, true. But if it's ending in M, R, or T, so here we go. Does amor end in M, R, or T? Oh, R. Yes, it does. Oh. Does amaris end in M, R, or T? No. Does a mater end in M, R, or T? Uh, yes, it does, but there's not one right in front of it, so it stays. Uh, does a mamor end in M, R, or T? Yes, but there's not one right in front of it, so it stays. Does a mamini end in M, R, or T? No, it doesn't. Does a munter end in M, R, or T? Yes, but there's not one right in front. The so second reason we kill macrons... It doesn't mean you kill on the root. It means you kill it literally if it's right, right in front. It. That's exactly right. So the second rule is if we have an NT or an ND anywhere. Do we have an NT anywhere or ND anywhere that has a macron right in front of it? A mantor. A mantor, there it is. Okay. Oh, that's why those rules that's exist. That's why those rules exist. That's why they exist. So if it's the end in an R? M, R, or T. So if they end, the, the last letter is M, R, or T. 
And you can think of the word mortis, M-R-T, mort, uh, death. Or anywhere in the word, and again, we're talking about the macron right in front if you have an N-D or N-T. So in conjugating that verb in the passive, we didn't change a thing except our endings. The only thing we changed is instead of going ost, mostis, unt, when we got to step four about the endings, we switched it to rister, mer, mini, inter. That's it. So before we do the imperfect, um, because now things are getting really fun, in a really cool way. Your eyes are going to see things that have been there the whole time. You just didn't know it. So when I see a verb, for example, monamer versus monamus, up to this point, we've kind of said, oh, mus, right? Mus is my ending, and it's, it tells me first person plural. But now you have eyes to see. What does must also tell you? Active. Active, yeah. So must tells you three things. Mer tells you three things. First person, plural, passive. It's kind of cool. The O does the same thing. That one little letter O, right, um O, tells me active first person singular. Versus if I swap that O out, or I, rather, I add the R, which kills the macron, right? Passive first-person singular. I am loved versus I love. So if we know our steps for the present, we can see, actually, it's only step four. And by the way, now we're going to see the same thing in the imperfect. So we get to, again, review how to build our imperfect and our future, and we're just going to swap out the endings. So here we go. I'm going to erase this to give myself a little space. For the imperfect, we have a slightly different first step. We have to figure out the conjugation, and therefore we have to find the stem. So we call this the, really I call it the imperfect stem, but we can call it the present stem. That's fine. So we need to find our present stem. So this is kind of fun. If we know our present, we can actually skip all the way to step three. So what is our present stem for amo amara? Um, ama. Ama, good. So here we go. We're, let's fill in ama all the way. And again, this is the beautiful thing of kind of following directions. My five-year-old Levi and I, we were talking today, and he was reminding me of what a hard time he had with this one particular Lego. And I said, well, why did you have such a hard time? He said, oh, because I didn't follow the direction. Hmm. I'm like, yep, that's it. Following the directions, it's, it's just good. It's just good for life. Follow my instruction, my son. Okay, so we've got our present stem. Then what do we add for the imperfect? Bum, boss, but. Uh, but, oh, don't do that. This is why I don't chant bum, boss, butt. Do you see why? No. Okay, but you're going to now. Watch. Let's add the tense sign. Remember, the thing that tells us that it's the imperfect is ba ba, imperfect she, ba ba ba, ba 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 ba. Okay, so here we go. Now I've got my ba's, I've got my stem plus my tense sign you know what? plus my ending. Well, but we, we never, so I am a lazy Latin person uh -huh. in that I don't ever write Latin, so I don't ever have to do this because yeah. I only have to translate it. So if yeah. I see bum that spot, I... Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, and this is, you know, yeah, it, it's more than what 99% of people learning Latin need to do. So now we can add our endings. Before, what we had was mst, mostis, unt, right? Bum, bas, but, bum, spot, his bunt, after the macrons were killed. Now, though, let's make it passive. Instead of I was loving, I was being loved. So here we go. Rr, ris, ter, mer, mini, inter. And of course, step four kill our macrons.
final M, R, and T. So there's a final R, N, T, N, D, anywhere. A bumper. Do you, no, do you get rid of that? On the, oh, yeah. Just right in front of it, right? So ba got shortened. Uh -huh. So it becomes bar, baris, bater, bomber, bomany, bunter. I was loved, or I was being loved, that's really clunky English. I was loved, you were loved, he was loved, we were loved, y'all were loved, they were loved. Okay? <coughs> the future, same thing. Same, same thing. I'm going to erase those endings for a second. Future, step one is grab our present stem. And just for fun, I'm going to change up verbs now, just so we can see it with another verb. Uh, I'll grab maneo, manere, I warn. So admonish, you can see that word, maneo, manere. So my present stem of maneo is mane. mane. So let's build it. Oops. Now, Here's where I will kind of break my pattern of teaching just a smidge. Because we have a spelling change, and this one's just a little awkward. So, technically the future has a tense sign, but I don't usually teach the future as a tense sign. Because the vowel is jumping around, right? So it's bo, bis, bit, bimis, bit, is bunt. So in a sense, the tense sign is that B-I. But the I doesn't show up two of the times, right? Bo, bis, bit, bimis, bim, pardon me, bimus, bitis, bunt. So the tense sign is a B-I. But most students, we learn it as bo, bis, bit, bimus, bitis, bunt. So it's, it's fine to learn it as a tense sign. I'll kind of put that as an option here. So you could add your B if you wanted to. I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to show you why. Because there's one little spelling change that would throw you even further for a loop. So, our passive endings, um, I'll show both active and passive. So, the active endings would be bo, bis, bit, bimus, bitis, bunt. Our passive endings, I'll put Bor, so it's still B-O with an R, but then here's the weird one, betteris. Instead of bitteris, it's betteris. So I'm just going to put a little asterisk, you know, a little star over that. So betteris with an E. But otherwise, it is what we would expect. Bor, betteris, bitter, bimmer, bimini, bunter. Bor, Beres, Bitter, Bimmer, Bimini, Punter. So, again, you could think of it as it's a B-I or it's a B, um, but the, the vowel jumps around enough that this one exception, I, I found it you know, helpful enough to just say, oh, it's Bor, Beres, Bitter, Bimmer, Bimini, Punter. Okay. So, Mane, Bo, I will warn. Mane, Bis, you will warn. Mane, Bit, he will learn. Mane, Bimus, we will warn. Y'all will learn, warned, they will learn. Manebor, I will be warned. Manebaris, you will be warned. He will be warned. We will be warned. Y'all will be warned, or you all will be warned, and they will be warned. Okay? So the main thing that we're going to have to retrain or reacclimate our eyes to, and even our minds to, is this changing of endings and how that our rister, mermini, inter is just going to take it passive. And it's awkward for us in English because we're always taught, right, don't write in the passive, it's not yeah. correct. Um, that's false, of course. Okay. So the other thing that's going to happen in this chapter is we get to rethink the flow of our sentences. So this is kind of fun. It gives you a little mental reset from the Latin for just a second. Up to this point, this is kind of fun. How would we define a verb? 
Like, think about how you would define a verb. Action or being. Okay, state of action or being. All right. And, and that's a pure definition. How most people would define a verb, and even if you look at, like, the Shirley Grammar curriculum, um, which is why we break away from that, is it, it, it has you ask a series of questions, which is, um, like, who is Where doing it and what are they doing? Because it could be a passive verb, right? So watch. If we just think of a, of a verb as what the subject is doing, so Caesar crosses the river, right? We could say subject noun, Caesar crosses, verb, and then river here. Actually, yeah, it would be a direct object. So we've got, if we you know, kind of wanted to label it up, subject noun, verb, transitive, article, adjective, the, river, direct object. And that's okay if our young students, you know, with the fourth graders, that's fine if they think of it, of it as the verb is what the subject does or is. But for us as, as older students, we actually can see that's a, that's a faulty kind of, uh, idea, right? The river, the Rubicon, right? Um, I guess he crossed many rivers, but the river is the one I'm thinking of. The river, yeah, is crossed by Caesar. So we can see that a verb, in the truest sense, is the action or is the state of being. It is not what the subject does. Because look, the passive verb breaks that definition, very clearly breaks that definition. So to this point, for us as students you know, and for our, our kids, the sentence flows, so to speak, from left to right. Subject does the verb to the direct object. Caesar crosses the river. But what we can see is that in a passive verb, right, there's our, my complete verb, in a passive verb, the flow comes backwards. Because it's still the same person doing the verb, right? Caesar is the one crossing the river. But we're expressing that in an you know, inverse way. The river is crossed by Caesar. And in Latin and in English grammar, we have a special term for this. This person or sentient thing, the, 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 the personal uh, individual doing the passive verb or performing the passive verb, in this case, right, Caesar doing the crossing, is what we call the agent. The agent. And in Latin, that will always be put into the ablative. And so we call that the ablative of agent. The river is crossed by Caesar. And so we would drop Caesar into the ablative, um, either with or without the preposition ah uh, hmm. or of. Okay. But it doesn't have to be there. It does not have to be there. And, and so for us, as we read, we kind of have to load up in our minds, uh-oh, I see a passive verb be on the lookout for an ablative sitting close by. And almost always the closest ablative is going to be an ablative of agent, the one doing the thing. Okay. But you'd still call that the subject noun? That's right. Because really, if we think back again, and this is why I love the passive, because it kind of breaks our mind a little bit and we have to rethink. The subject noun is the person or thing about which the verb is being predicated. So the subject stands in a subjective relationship with the predicate, by definition, right? So we are talking about a river. What are we saying about the river? The river is crossed, right? That's your simple sentence. So in the truest sense, grammatically and rhetorically, the subject is the thing you're talking about. And this is where the truth of what I, I know our re English teachers were trying to teach us is when you do this, it makes the thing receiving the action the focus, right? right? So rather than the actor being the focus, the receiver is the focus. Which, by the way, it's going to be kind of fun to think about that theologically, right? Think about this theologically. Is the main part of the story that Christ saves sinners, or that sinners are saved by Christ? That might be a huge theological question, actually, to kind of dig into. What's the main thing? 
Is the main thing sinner, the redemption of sinners, or is the main thing the glorification of Christ? Sorry, I kind of asked that question in a cheating way, didn't I? Yeah. But anyway, right? I mean, it, grammatically, we're reflecting a bias towards it. I mean, it's, I, you could think of this as the, the, the grammatical equivalent of the selfie, where you're making the little thing the main thing, rather than turning your phone towards the beautiful you know, vista behind, or in front of you or something. Um, <laughs> with the, how you do the, um, the verb, like the is crossed, is it always like is something? It is. So we always need a helper plus okay. this is what's called the perfect participle. So there won't be like in Latin, there won't be like a... No. So in Latin, um, so for example, let's, let's look at it in Latin. We'll go... Um, with a kind of a, a simple little sentence to illustrate. Okay. Puer femina amater. Do the same thing. Start with your verb. Amater, right? And when I see amater, immediately warning, you know, at least now at the beginning of this, Warning bells should start screaming in my mind. I've got a passive verb. I've got a passive verb. Verbis ter. There it is. So I'm going to still have this subject noun, or if I have a subject noun, but I need to be careful. And so usually I have students just kind of label the pass to know, oh, this is a passive verb. Watch out. Because almost always, especially in the beginning, we still want to treat it like it's an active verb. Um, something like the boy loves the woman. Um, I didn't mean to make this so. Uh, the boy is loved by the woman. <laughs> yeah. So the boy. Okay. Sorry. It's, uh, what's that? What's the the graduate or? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, anyway. Ah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think we should have gone with girl. Anyway. So we still have puer as our subject noun in the nominative singular. That's not like a joke about us, is it? <laughs> like that I'm so old. <laughs> no. Um, but I can see right that femina is an ablative. And so again, if I load up that category, when I see the passive verb, I've got an ablative standing next to a passive, that's going to be an agent. Again, nine times out of ten, that's going to be, um, if it's a person, it's going to be an agent. You label it so agent. You don't label I it. do. Oh. I label it as agent. Just, especially at the beginning, if, if you want to label it, usually even at this point, you're kind of done with label. You can't, you don't have to be. Right, right. But anyway, um, that's the most helpful thing to do is because it reminds us of that category. So the boy is loved by the woman. By the girl, if we want to make it more. So or the man is loved by the woman. Like it's but it's always is love. Like it's like that's That's right. So because that's how in English we make it passive. But then what if you have like the uh, You're gonna drop it into another tense? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So we're just, let's take the same sentence, just for the sake of you know time and ease, and let's put uh, uh, let's make it an imperfect. I'm not I don't even want to say the English, but let's take that instead of the boy is loved by the woman. Let's drop it into the imperfect. So grab my present stem plus ba plus my passive ending. I can't think of her. <laughs> ba. So ba is going to be my tense sign. What's the stem? Botter. Botter, good. So that's my ending, right? And my stem would be ama. Ama botter. Good. So there we go. Same thing, but now we have an imperfect passive indicative third person singular verb. So then that would be the boy was loved? You could do it simply or more of a true imperfect. The boy was being loved by the woman. Well, that's what I was getting at with the is love. Yes. So it's going to be, so it's like for the imperfect, it would be was being, and for the future, will be being. Will, no, not will be being, but will, will be loved. loved. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So in English, we need um, a linking verb plus a perfect passive participle, is what that loved or warned or stabbed or killed or whatever it is. Um, I love how I just went from love to stabbed in four examples. That's excellent. Good job. From warned to stabbed. Yeah, love to warn the staff to kill. Caesar stole in your mind. That's right. That's right. I can't get away from him. Um, so yeah, the, the the neat thing about this lesson is it really lets us kind of hone in on our verbs and walk carefully and very precisely through these endings. Um, the and it only adds one thing besides that, which is this agent who will come in and help us. Okay. So why do you always put? 
this is a dumb WWE, but like, is loved? Is loved. Will, was being loved? Was being loved. Will be loved? Mm -hmm. Like, all those, are they loved? Looks kind of like a past tense. It is. And, and that's because in English and in Latin, actually, we only have a, uh, in English, we only have two true participles. Um, so that is called a perfect passive participle. So the dinner is cooked. Yeah, I guess that's how we do it. But, but look at your other option. The dinner is cooking. Watch, ready? The boy is loved versus the boy is loving. Do you see oh, the difference there? Active, that's exactly right. So in English and in Latin, this is it's awesome how it makes you ask this question. In English, we have two participial options. We have the present option and we have the perfect option. There is only, in English, a, oops, sorry, a present active participle. There is only, in English and Latin, a perfect passive participle. So we don't have a verb in English, a participial verb in English, that says something like, I am loving did. Because you know, it doesn't exist, so I have to kind of imagine what it might look like, you know, were I to dig it up in the grounds yeah. of fossils or something. So, present, I am loving id. Or perfect, um, the dinner is cooked, passive, is cooked. He is loved. He is loved it I mean, I'm trying, you know, it just little doesn't exist. Like that, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, little kids might, because they just don't know that little Johnny, that just, that form doesn't exist in our language. Mm -hmm. So we, in Latin and in English, Latin has two more options. Latin has a future active and passive. So it's but, the helping verb that determines the That's right. Case. The tense. That's exactly right. The helping verb determines the tense. Um, so the boy was being loved versus the boy is loved versus the boy will be loved. So it's those helpers and tense signs um, that tell us what it is. So, so is, tense was, signs. will be. And will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the boy, in this case, because we have botter, botter, so imperfect, the boy was being loved by the woman. So femina here is in the ablative. And again, when we see that ablative standing right next to a passive verb, overwhelmingly, especially right now when they're teaching us. By the way, they're almost always going to give us the preposition to start with. So you can be on the lookout for a uh, femina, by the woman. So that ablative of agent is going to be the one who's actually doing the verb, doing the loving or the seeking or whatever it is. So be on the lookout for that with these translations. Kind of make that the focus, and you'll see it brings a lot of clarity to your translation of just first, even before you're messing with prepositional phrases or whatever, really if you'll hammer out that subject-verb relationship, it, it just makes a world of difference. So, right, if I ignore that and I just realize that this is the boy was being loved, or the boy was loved, it's fine to say it was loved, um, that really does the, the majority of the work for you. Um, so just really, again, honing in on that verb, or in this case, with the, as we switch to passive, honing in on the verb and the subject. Okay. Anything else for us? <laughs> You've been quiet. You're still on mute, Russ. I don't want to talk to you anyway. It's all right. I think you're still muted. <laughs> there you go. He's been calling out answers and can't figure out. I know. Have you been talking this whole time, Russ? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else I can go over or clarify? No. Is that all right? Okay. Awesome. Well, chapter 18, I hope the sentences will go well. I'll, I'll, I'll get motivated and turn these ones out to you early because I... I think it's a great chapter to do a little bit of that review. With. Don't turn it up too early, because then oh. it's too easy to remember. Oh, then it's too easy. Oh, okay. That's right. I have to remember your human nature, right? And <laughs> if you give it right to us, we'll go we'll right to it. <laughs> oh, shoot. Awesome. Well, that's it then. I'll see you guys in about a month or so. Are we going to have it next week? You're or welcome. Does it depend You're on welcome. Less oh, yeah, it does. It depends uh, on our child. So we have a baby coming. So, like, like soon, so, or a month or so. So, yeah, we, we'll, we might do it. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But I'll, I'll keep you, I'll keep you abreast. It might be like a, an early December or a late December or something. Because actually, the next three lessons really are just focusing on this passive system. So, it's it's gonna feel nice and slow. I hope. I think. It will. So, awesome. See you guys.
See you guys. Bye-bye. Chris and I decided to do this.